best to apply after. <laughs> when Peter asked me if I would speak, can you all hear me, by the way? Uh, I told Peter I would speak on the new evangelization and the year of faith, as well as practical ways of achieving the new evangelization. So let me just begin by asking the question, what is the new evangelization? And I get this from the bishops' uh, conference, was on their webpage. It says, the new evangelization calls each of us to deepen our faith, believe in the gospel message, and go forth to proclaim the gospel. The focus of the new evangelization calls all Catholics to be evangelized and then go forth to evangelize. In a special way, the new evangelization is focused on reproposing, reproposing the gospel to those who have experienced a crisis in faith. Pope Benedict XVI called for the reproposing of the gospel, quote, to those regions awaiting the first evangelization and to those regions where the roots of Christianity are deep, but who have experienced a serious crisis of faith due to secularization. The new evangelization invites each Catholic to renew their relationship with Jesus Christ and the church. I found that interesting because basically, again, it's what Pope Benedict in this year of faith <coughs> is challenging us to. He proposes that before anything, the year of faith is one where we can encounter this living God. How can we make him present? How can we experience his healing power and his strength? In Go and Make Disciples, there are three goals that I think are pertinent to what we're talking about today. Let me just reiterate those goals and share a little bit about them. In Go and Make Disciples, the first goal is this, to bring about in all Catholics such an enthusiasm for their faith that in living their faith in Jesus, they share free, free, freely, they share freely with others. Now that's something that we're still after 40 years, 50 years of speaking about evangelization that we as Catholics aren't used to doing. I think we've taken our faith for granted for so long, it's still very difficult for us to be enthusiastic about our faith and to share it enthusiastically. And that's where I think we have to really look and examine and through reconciliation because that can be one of our failures. When we begin Mass and we use the prayer, the confidior, say, for what I've done, what I have failed to do. I think of one of our biggest failures as Catholics is showing enthusiasm for our faith. We oftentimes, as Catholics, tend to apologize for our faith. I met a guy yesterday, I was doing a, a funeral in Manchester, and <clears throat> I'm sure he was an evangelical, praise God, not having one with evangelicals. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the prayer that I said at Mount Calvary Cemetery, was, I told him to go forth in hope. So he says, what do you mean by that, in hope? And I said, well, we live in hope. St. Paul says, hope will not disappoint us. He says, I'm not sure what you're talking about. He says, well, we live in faith. I said, I'm sure we do, but we live in hope, too. <laughs> and I said, I don't know what the, what the debate is all about. But anyways, my point is, you know, we oftentimes will just back away. I mean, I refuse to do that. I know what I believe. I know what I said. I said, my words are what I said. It's what I believe. I'm not going to apologize. But getting back to this thing of having an enthusiasm for our faith, and are we so enthused about Jesus Christ? Has he made such a difference in my life, in your life, that we're willing to invite people to be part of it, to share it? I think that's one thing that we as Catholics fail to do, because we're not enthused enough about our faith. Now, I can't create enthusiasm. I can't make myself be enthused, but I can surround myself by people 
I can listen, whether it be to DVDs or CDs or read scripture and get my heart ablaze. There's a beautiful uh, scripture in 1 Timothy that says, I remind you to stir into flame the spirit that you receive when hands were laid on you. The spirit that you receive is not a spirit of cowardice, but one that makes you strong, loving, and wise. One that makes you strong, loving, and wise. The Holy Spirit can renew us. Second thing I want to share is the goal, number two, is to invite all people in the United States, whatever their social or cultural background, to hear the message of salvation in Jesus Christ, so they may come to join us in the fullness of a Catholic faith, to invite. <coughs> Invitation is key to the new evangelization. The new evangelization is really the old evangelization. It's sharing the good news, but we have to renew it because we live in a culture where so many people have become indifferent to the faith. So I want to share some practical ways in which we can do that. Invitation. Invite people. Invite people back to church. I find that the majority of Catholics who have left the church just became lazy. I mean that. They stopped going to church one week or two weeks or three weeks. It became a habit. Now, oftentimes what they simply need is an invitation to come back. And that's not up to me to do because I don't have the time. But you live in neighborhoods that are filled with former Catholics. There, is, there are millions of former Catholics in the United States. Thousands right here in Salem. Thousands in Exeter and Brentwood and Stratum, all the places we cover. Kingston and East Kingston. All these people who over the years, for some reason or other, have left their faith. They be Often them, they're lazy, or they may have been hurt. Our invitation can make a big difference. I'm going to give you a few examples of things that I do. I'm still after, I made my Cursia 42 years ago. I'm still very sold on Cursia, and I know here at St. Bale's you have a very active Cursia movement. When I arrived in Newmarket, it'll be four years in June, I noticed there were very few people coming to church. And uh, I decided to get a pastoral plan. It was very simple. It was invitation. So I did two things. I got rid of CCD. We had a terrible CCD program that had, it usually took place at 8 a.m. on Sunday mornings. And mass there is at 9.30. So whoever has a 7.30 mass in Exeter would go to the 9.30 Mass in Newmarket. So usually by the time I arrived, I'd be there every other week, I would go downstairs where religious said was taking place, and it was right at the time when the parents were coming to pick up the kids. But of course, what I noticed was that nobody was going upstairs. They were picking up their kids and leaving. So two or three times, very, very... Um, nicely, I said, gee, where? I said, don't you guys go to Mass? And they all looked at me. They weren't being mean. They were just dumb. Um, <laughs> no, no. They just left and they thought I was nice and went to their cars. <laughs> so I said, well, this is going to change. <laughs> or anyway, that May I announced to them, I had all the parents come up. I said, now just, you know, next year we're going to, well, I'm canceling CCD and we're going to be doing a family-based program. Well, all hell broke. <laughs> we don't want to do this. And you're crazy. And I said, well, we're doing it. I don't care what you say. So get over it or find another place to go because we're doing it. And I had somebody witness, somebody I knew from Manchester who had been involved with the family-based program. They came with their six kids. It didn't go over well at all. Uh -oh. So anyways, that September, I said, well, whatever happens, happens. So what I started doing was educating the adults on a Tuesday night. The adults had to come to religion classes. Well, it went okay. It was the first year, but there was a lot of um, fallback, you know. But those who came, came, and we started seeing the place grow. And 
So that year I decided, I, I saw all these men and women who were pretty key, they were pretty consistent. So I went up to these six guys and I said, now, just you know, I said, in March, I'm going to be on a Curcio weekend. Would you like to make a Curcio? What is it? So I explained it. It's a weekend. We go away. You're going to be at a small group table. Men go one week and women go to other. There's a team of men. I'll be the spiritual director. You get there on a Thursday night. There's three legs. I explain everything. You don't remember anything, so it doesn't matter. I don't feel it's secretive because I don't remember. Because there'll be study, piety, action. We'll celebrate Mass, and you'll receive all kinds of nice things during the weekend. So how could you say no? So the six guys said, we'll go. Great. So it was an invitation. See, invitation. You get invited. So I brought him on Curcio, and during the weekend I just saw it all unfold. And these guys who had been very, one of them, a younger man in his 20s, single, teaching in a private school, was extremely, extremely shy. And I thought throughout the week he never said a word, even at his group table. And I said, this is going to be a disaster. Well, he ended up becoming perhaps the most touched, the most profoundly touched by the weekend. He's now in charge of my young adult group at St. Mary's. <coughs> but I want to make a point. So what's happened out of that invitation is these guys came back, and they in turn invited other guys. So in two years' time, I have like 20 guys who have made Curcio. We meet every other Tuesday morning. I leave Exeter at 5.30 a.m. I meet with them at 6 a.m. in the morning, 6 to 7. Then we all go upstairs where I celebrate <coughs> Mass. And one of them came up to me about two years ago and said, Father Mark, we don't have Eucharistic adoration here. I said, no, we don't. I can't do it all. He says, I'll start it. Once a week, not long, we just started. 7 to 10 on a Tuesday, Wednesday night, we have Eucharistic adoration once a month. He gets up at all the masses once a month, the week before, and invites people, has a sign-up list. As guys get the door, cursiistas, they take names, they invite people. Our religious education program has gone from like 15 very uh, angry families to about 50. It keeps growing. Every year it's growing. But it's all about invitation and challenging. And what I've done in the religious ed program, we now meet on Sunday, so what we've done is we meet after the 9.30 Mass, and I'm there. We meet once a month, and they're given lessons to bring home to educate their own children. Now, again, I'm not going to tell you it's perfect. It's not perfect. <coughs> I'll tell you this. It's better than what we had. Because adults are coming to know Jesus Christ. Adults like coming. They tell their friends. They're bringing friends back to church. I've been able to bless marriages, bring people back to church. So my greatest challenge this year was to do that in, in Exeter. Exeter has a, about 2,000 families. We had about 900 kids in religious education. We confirmed last year 107 kids. <coughs> and this year we have 102 for First Communion. We cover Brentwood and we cover uh, Kensington, Kingston, East Kingston, Exeter, of course, Stratum, part of Greenland. So we cover a lot of territory. So last year I approached my religious ed coordinator and youth minister. I said, well, we're changing our religious ed program. We don't want to say, I don't care, I'm the pastor, and we are changing. <laughs> I said, this ain't working. It's not working. It's, it's a disaster. Because <clears throat> again, we had it there on Sunday mornings in the Lincoln Street School down the street. No one comes to church. I mean, the church is full because we have a big parish. Church only seats 490. So we have four Masses on the weekend. They're pretty full. But we should really have eight Masses on the weekend when you think of the population. So this year in September, we made the move. And what's happening is most of these people I've never seen because they never came to church. Now we have four, we don't have a lot of space like you guys do right here at St. Maurice. We only have one hall. So we have four sessions on one weekend a month. We meet after the 4 o'clock Mass, after the 11 o'clock Mass, we have dinner, lunch. Then we meet Sunday afternoon, 5 to 7, 
Sunday night, 6 to 8, and Monday night, 6 to 8. So we have four sessions a weekend. We're getting about 1,300 people who come, kids and adults. So we teach all the adults. Now, again, it's not perfect, but my point is this. I'm meeting people I've never seen before. I'll be there four years in June. And I'm going after them. I go after the men. I go after the women. How you, every night or before any session, I go around the tables, introduce myself. I sit with them. I go up to them. What, uh, would you like to be part of whatever? I invite them. Would you like to be on a retreat? Would you like them to a couple's evening? Now, I'm not getting a big response, but I'm getting a response. I'm getting more people than I ever would have gotten had I not done this. Now, I'm not the only one involved in this, so I want to go back to this. It takes a lot of people to do this. So every time I do a session for adults, I have people who are getting up to witness, have a 10-minute witness. So a few weeks ago, I had a guy get up and speak about reconciliation. He told the people, it's a guy's head of my pastoral council, he says, you know, he says, the, the conversion I had to go through when I came back to the church, because I was away for many years, was not to see the church the way I saw it when I left at 17 years old, as a bitter, angry teenager. I want you to look at this church today as adults. And if you've had problems with the church in the past, he says, get over it. Look at it as an adult, not as a kid. So it was a great response for reconciliation. I had quite a few families who called who said they'd never been to reconciliation. And what I did, I did a role play with my evangelist. We role played reconciliation. Most people didn't even know what reconciliation was. We use the term confession, penance, reconciliation, it's all the same. Ladies, it's all the same. They're just different words. Uh, then the month before, I had a couple come in from Auburn that I'd met many years ago in Manchester who had <coughs> seen marriage simply as a convenient thing to have kids. They had three kids. He's a cop in Manchester, rides the horse in Manchester, never went to church. It was a gist, and I say this lovingly, and it was a real bastard type guy. <laughs> well, he was. His wife, they were ready for a divorce. And through his mother's efforts, who was a Eucharistic minister at St. Marie, she invited him to church. Didn't want to come. She said, if you come, your father and I will buy you breakfast. Ah. So he came. <laughs> he was then living with them because his wife had thrown him out of the house. So he came to church, went through a powerful conversion during Mass. The Holy Spirit touched him. He felt this fire go through him. He didn't know what was there. He started to cry. His mother thought he was crying because of the divorce. He <laughs> says, no, something's happening. <laughs> Holy Spirit, how God works. It was today he and his wife go around witnessing what God has done in their marriage. Wow. They've had a complete healing. They're evangelizing. And they're going around. To Father Mark, I'll talk anywhere. Wow. I want people to know the healing power of the Holy Spirit. So I had them speak at an, you know, my whole week, and they came to four sessions. I bought them dinner at the end. <laughs> they came to four sessions and spoke about what God had done in their lives. And see, that's what I mean about invitation. We gotta make it real. You gotta make faith real to people because there are so many people out there they don't have a clue as to what their faith is. For them, it's just something else they do. They bring their kids to Little League, and they go shopping, and maybe twice a year they go to church. So every time they come, every month when they come, I have somebody, when they speak, they always subtly bring in the whole thing of, we go to church weekly. I always have a witness. Make sure you keep saying that, because the more they hear it, the more they hear how important putting God at the center of their lives is, the more important they're going to be transformed. Now, do I have thousands coming back? No. And I'm not going to tell you because I'd be lying. But I'm planting seeds, see? That's what you've got to do. You've got to start planting seeds. And I look at it this way. I've got nothing to lose. So a lot of these people weren't even coming into church. So I've got, I, this is funny. I've been there four years. 
And the guy before me was also Mark, Mark Thuin. <coughs> so one of the first sessions, this guy me says, Father Mark, he says, you, he says I, I, I know I haven't been here for a while, and I just said, well, I'll let him go. He says, did you shave your mustache? And I, said, I said, well, no, I never had one. He goes, well, you look different. I said, I said no. I said, you're talking about Mark Truen, who's been gone four years. <laughs> Mark Truen has, had a, has a mustache. I don't have one. He's been gone four years. Don't worry about it. Anyway. Okay, goal number three, that in go and make disciples, is this. To foster gospel values in our society, <coughs> promoting the dignity of the human person, the importance of the family, and the common good of our society so that our nation may continue to be transformed by the saving power of Jesus Christ. To foster the gospel values in our society, promoting the dignity of the human person, and that's a real challenge for us in our culture today. But, for instance, we have the 40 days for life during Lent. I promote that. I go, walk, I go and pray in front of the clinic in Greenland, the women's clinic. I go with the, we have a great Knights of Columbus Council in Exeter. Fine, fine men. And they're very involved in 40 days for life. So I try to promote that. I go with them. I promote it with our parish. I think... Those are things that we need to do. I promote family values constantly. I talk about family values from the pulpit. How you can promote family values. Eating together once a week, twice a week. Something we don't do in our families anymore. Talking to your kids. Those are things, again, are all part of the new evangelization. And how we can promote greater values in the church and in our society. Our society is falling apart. And I'm not a pessimist. I'm a realist. But I think we can also be a transformative light. We can give example to the culture of what needs to happen as we pray together. You know, invite, we do a vocation cross once a week. And a few weeks ago, I had a couple come in, and they spoke about the vocation cross to all these families again. They spoke about how in their family, they never prayed together until they started picking up the vocation cross. And now, every so often when they get the vocation cross, it forces the family to do something they've never done before. Because a vocation cross gives them directions, very simple, on how they can come together in front of a crucifix and pray for an increase of vocations to priesthood and religious life. Those are all little things that we can do. Very practical. Every Sunday at the end of Mass, I call up a family so what we did in the last two sessions ago, a family program, Garrett and Carolyn, who are in charge of the program, they spoke at all the, the four sessions and at the end invited people to sign up. So now we have so many people who signed up, we don't have enough crosses to give them. That's okay. So every Sunday now at the 4 and 7.30 and 9 and 11 o'clock mass, we call people up, a family up, to come and get the vocation cross. So it's a good sign for the parish to see families that are praying together and evangelizing. So again, those three goals, enthusiasm for faith, inviting people, invitation. Again, I still say Curcio is one, it's one of many. It's one way that we can people can be transformed in one weekend. If there's good follow-up, it's even better. So don't be afraid to go up to people that you see in church and say, have you ever thought of making a cursio? What is it? Tell them. Don't play games with them. Tell them what the cursio is. Invite them to go. Bring them to cursio. Pray for them while they're on. It's a transform. I had a kid last week from Exeter who went on the Engage, on the uh, Tech Teenage Encounter Christ weekend here at St. Basil's again and came back flying Tim Doucette. Do you know Tim Doucette's son? Very active. <coughs> okay. Anyway, so that's a wonderful way again of just allowing people to experience the power of God. Okay. Our Catholic bishops, and they talk about this new evangelization and this year of faith, 
Tell us, I want, how long do I have today? To as long as you want. As long as you want. No, no, I'm not going to go as long as I want. I forgot to go. I'm doing a mission this week in Enfield. So I get to I get leave later this afternoon. Um, no, it's not going to be a lot. No, the same. No, no, no. Still. Okay. So let me, we want to talk about what this, this year of faith is and how we can bring it about. This is what the bishop has t have talked about. Is to engage more intently those who are faithful and need to be renewed with increased catechesis. I brought, you know, we are all familiar with the catechism that was published quite a few years ago already, 20 years ago. Yeah. But the United States bishops have published our own catechism now, which is much better. Are you familiar with it? it it's, um, I wasn't even until about two, so I went on the website, realized they had one. I was embarrassed. I didn't even know, but this is wonderful, and I'm going to tell you why. Because it's very. The other one that was published 20 years ago was meant to be basically um, a worldwide catechism from which bishops of every country would gain knowledge and then write their own. It took us quite a few years. We finally done it. It's very, very well done. It's simple. But, but I, I think for any parish who want to do a study for it, it would be great. Every chapter begins with the life of an, Amer of an American saint or hero, like Thomas Merton or Dorothy Day or, you know, our first bishop. I mean, it's very, very well done. It goes through the four legs, again, of the catechism, you know, uh, the creed, what we believe in, the sacraments, the moral aspect of the church, uh, how we act, the Ten Commandments, the attitudes, and finally, a life of prayer. It's, again, I, I can't I tell you enough how much I've enjoyed looking through this. And I'm going to be pushing it in my next two missions that I'm giving to you. Like, like on number six, man and woman in the beginning. Creation of man and woman, the fall and the promise. They begin with the story of... Um, uh, Rose Hawthorne, you know, a great American saint, then. Nathaniel Hawthorne, a great poet, is an author, his daughter. Anyways, catechesis means how do we engage people in learning more about their faith? And there's so many wonderful things. If you've not experienced yet the series on Catholicism, have you seen the Catholicism series? Yeah, the that. DVD by Barron. I'm doing it at, at Newmarket on Friday night. Just did, did number two last night. If you've not seen that, that's a wonderful way again of bringing people into the church who maybe have been away, of understanding more about their faith. It's very gentle. It's very, very well done. There are excellent DVDs out there. So we have to engage people, invite people to participate in things. And again, it doesn't mean that if you're going to be always successful. I find in Exeter, people are very slow in responding. But one thing I keep telling my staff, we don't give up. We keep inviting. Even if only 30 people come, we're going to keep inviting. And that's the thing. You've got to be persistent. You can't give up. Winston Churchill once said, never give up. Never give up. Never give up. I don't give up. I keep going. I'm not going to give up till I die. That's it. Okay. Okay, the next thing is reach out to those who have never heard the good news proclaimed. They're, you know, everybody has a hole in their heart. And the hole in their heart is for what it's for God. They don't know it. So they, we try to fill our hearts, all of us, myself included, we try to fill it with food or with addiction, addictive behavior, whatever it is. But people are hungry to know the truth. And it's incumbent upon us as Christians, to invite them. Invite them to know the truth. Jesus is going to set them free. You know, I have a guy in my uh, parish uh, in uh, Newmarket. His name is Matt Evangelista. Matt's a big guy. He's to be a professional baseball player. And one day I met him. He was in the back of church. I said, Matt, I said, uh, have you ever thought of making a cursillo? Again, what's that, et cetera. I told him. He said, well, I don't know. I don't know. So then I noticed for about three weeks, this, he wasn't coming. Three months, he hadn't come to religious ed. So one night I called him. I said, I'm going to call him. I called him. It was, like, well, it was, it was an afternoon. It was two in the afternoon, and he had his, his cell phone number to my religious ed office. So I called Rachel. I said, Rachel, give me Matt Evangelista's number. 
Well, I have a cell phone. Give me a cell phone, even better. <laughs> so I call him up and I said, Matt, Father Mark. So I haven't seen you in Kristen lately. Well, we've been busy. I said, what are you doing tonight? He said, well, what do you mean? I'll, I'll stop in for dinner. Oh. <laughs> said, there was a year, so I'll come over for dinner. <laughs> so I went over. Ne they've never missed a session since. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you what else happened. Uh, I'll tell you what else happened. Not only have they had they missed a session, he made his cursio. She's making her cursio in April. Uh, besides that, last night I get into church. Because what I do on Friday nights in Newmarket, I do. 5.30 confession, 6 mass, 6.30 stations, and 7 o'clock soup bread and, and the series of the DVD. So people can choose whatever they want to come to. So last night, he comes in with his little girl. It's a big Mark says, Francesca, that's his daughter. She'd like to begin serving mass. No problem. So Francesca last night served mass for the first time. She was great. I led her through. There was another little server who came, helped her out. But you see, it's all those little things that you begin to do. It's all about invitation, invitation, <coughs> invitation, catechesis. And Matt comes now every Friday night, the last two nights. Fridays has been there listening. You know, again, the people you least expect. I had a guy the other night came to see me, just went through a painful divorce, very lonely, comes in to see me. He talked to my evangelist slash apologist, I call him. He had talked to him one day, so Tom says, why don't you call this guy? His name was Steve, so I called Steve up. I met with them last week, and at the end of the evening, after I you know, figured out where he was coming from, I said, Steve, I said, well, have you ever thought of making a cursillo? What's that? So I explained <laughs> it to him. gave him, I have forms in them. I just gave him the form. I said, why don't you care? I said, by the way, come this Friday night. We're doing a DVD series. What's it on? It's just come. He was there last night. It's invitation. He's lonely, went through a divorce, now is the time to get him. <laughs> <laughs> and the final thing though, is that we have to re-engage those who have been baptized, who have, again, lost that fire. There's so many people among us who have lost the fire. We need to re-engage them, stirring back into fire. So I just want to encourage you as we... Um, continue this great year of faith. It is a wonderful <coughs> year, a wonderful time for us to engage people, not to shy away from doing what every one of us who have been baptized should be doing. To so the role of evangelization is not just for the clergy. Well, I think we have, we still have it wrong in the United States because we're so used to having the priest do everything. But everybody who has been baptized has that call to invite. Now the worst that can happen is people will say no, I don't want, that's fine. But you know what, sometimes they'll say no and they'll think about it and a year later they'll come back. I've seen that happen more and more times. You know, when, you, when I do a, a wedding, and I do a lot of weddings, I, by the way, whenever a couple calls me for a wedding, I never, <coughs> never, never say are you registered. I say come in, they don't know what that means. To the language, huh? to the language we use, they don't know what I mean, that stuff. Are you a parishioner? That's like asking him, have you gone to Mars? Are you a <laughs> <laughs> my, my thing is just come in. And by the time they end, by the time they leave, I try and dwell in me, but not prison, but I've introduced them to Christ. I talk to them about the love God has for them. And I try to pray with every couple who comes in. Let me give you a blessing before you leave. Well, let me... Because so again, that's how you evangelize it. You don't have any weddings, it's because sometimes people call and you don't. Are you a Krishna? Right away, you've defeated it. My thing is, come in, let's talk. Let's talk and let's set a date and let's see what I can do for you. That's how they come back. That's how you get young people in your parish. I know from my experience at St. Marie's, that's how I get so many young <coughs> people coming back to church, was through invitation invitation. I think we have to be very, very sensitive to where people are coming from. Yes, they live together. It's part of this culture. They don't even know it's wrong. They don't have a sense of what's right or wrong in the culture you live in. So what do you do? You have to evangelize and call them forward and invite them. And that's how things are going to be 
subscribe back. And again, we live, and I tell people, I want to end with, because I always tell people in my church, life is messy. It's very messy. If you think that you're going to be able to just get life to be one particular way, forget it. You can do the best you can and still have a screwed up family. It's life. What are you going to do? You know, you, you, keep, you keep praying, you keep doing your best. That's all you can do, but you never give up. You keep, have a goal, have a vision. If you have a vision of what you want your church to look like, your parish, your family to look like, society to look like, you're ahead of many other people who don't even know how to dream anymore. We've got to be dreamers. We've got to be visionaries. And if we're not, we'll lose the battle. If we keep going, because we have Hebrews that says, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, on whom your faith depends from beginning to end. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. We've got to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. So let me just stand with a scripture from Ephesians. I love Ephesians. And uh, from the beginning of Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, where St. Paul writes the following. This is from chapter 1, verse 18 and following. May he enlighten your innermost vision. May he enlighten your innermost vision that you may know the great hope to which he has called you the wealth of his glorious heritage to be distributed among the members of the church and the immeasurable scope of his power in us who believe. The immeasurable scope of his power in us who believe. He compares it to this. It is like the strength, this immeasurable power, it is like the strength he showed in raising Christ from the dead and seating him at his right hand in heaven high above every principality, power, virtue, and domination in every name that can be given in this age and in the age to come. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.